Woo! So presumably you've made it through uh, part one with relative ease. I didn't really want uh, the first part of this lecture to be a particularly difficult um, discussion. I really just kind of wanted to frame what's going on, sort of give you some current events. Uh, if you're not, you know, if you haven't really followed all this stuff, uh, try to give you a relatively nonpartisan one. Because, um, uh, well, I think both sides are being pretty stupid about it at the moment, but um, I can understand why each side is doing what they want to do. I just happen to believe one side is um, a little bit more correct than the other at the moment. Uh, but that, that is neither here nor there. My political views should not be influencing uh, what you are learning or how you are learning. Um, it is purely economic views, and those are backed by, well, you know, like research and like thought and all that stuff instead of just like, oh, my feelings. So, um, yeah, anyways, um, debt ceiling part two. This is where we're going to get into a little bit of the math. So last time, we talked about like you know like history, the debt ceiling, current debate over the issue, all that fun stuff. Now it's time to talk about the economics of it all. And we're going to talk about how the government's budget constraint comes into play. Because there's really going to be like two players that were, well, there's multiple players, but there's going to be two main players we're concerned with here. And it's going to be the fiscal authority or like the treasury, essentially. And the monetary authority, which is the Federal Reserve in the United States. Now we're going to talk about like what all this stuff means, what the central bank can do about it, um, why it's bad if the central bank does too much about it, uh, also why it's bad if we take out too much debt. We're really going to talk about that one. So uh, for that, well, stay tuned. Just keep watching, basically. Just don't, don't push the space bar. Don't click the screen. Just kind of let it all keep playing through. Um, because, well, now we need to talk about a few assumptions surrounding the model, quote unquote, we'll be talking about. We're using a dynamic model. And what does that mean? Well, it means that whatever decisions we make today will influence what happens tomorrow, right? There's an intertemporal link between multiple time periods. Now, we're assuming the following about this. Every agent is infinitely lived. Now, Basically, that means that the model just goes on and on forever. This is a simplifying assumption. You're probably going to be like, well, what, dude, what the hell does it mean if every agent's infinitely lived? Like, people die, and that, that's true. People do die. Um, very astute observation. What I am assuming, however, is that there's like a dynasty, right? Think of like an institution. People within institutions die because that's what happens. But the institution lives on. So the same would work for like a household. Right, a particular household, think of like a family name, right? Like, you know, your family, you got your parents, then there's you, and there's gonna be your kids, and then their kids, right? So these decisions made about the economy are being made by different people, but they're constantly being made. So what we're assuming, just to kind of make things easier on us, is that instead of like, you know, people living to a certain point and then dying, and then like their progeny take over, we just assume that one person lives forever. It's what's known as a simplifying assumption. It makes things a little bit easier, and uh, honestly, the uh, end results really aren't all that different than if we did something a little, well, different. Uh, but there's different uses for certain things. You can use like an overlapping generations model if you're like concerned on like a public finance thing of like social security, but eh, whatever, I'm rambling. There are households, firms, there's a fiscal authority, there's a monetary authority, and the government the fiscal authority spends GT, government spending and GDP, right, with revenue collected by a lump sum tax and while well, selling bonds. More bonds being sold means more debt creation, right? So you don't want to sell too many bonds. You don't want to borrow too much because you can either tax or borrow. If you tax, well, you're going to piss everybody off. And if you borrow, well, again, you're going to piss everybody off, but you'll probably piss fewer people off because you can just pay it back later. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if you want to go out and drink chocolate milk. Chocolate milk. We're going to go with that. If you want to go out and drink chocolate milk, tomorrow you're probably not going to be feeling too great, right? Because of all that chocolate milk that you drank. But you might make the decision to go out and drink a lot of chocolate milk today and tonight anyways. Because, well, you know what? Future me, screw that guy, right? Then That slob can deal with my dumb decisions. Something like that, right? Um, but if you sell too many bonds, right, if you borrow too much, everybody's going to start to get worried. And when everybody starts to get worried, that's where things get really bad. Because bonds have to be repaid. If you borrow, you can't just go, well, you know what, I'm just going to 
borrow. And then to repay what I've borrowed, I'm going to borrow more, right? That doesn't work. There's actually a very, very important topic, uh, or not topic, thing, called a transversality condition uh, in these models that basically prevents that from happening. So you can't just repay bonds by taking out more debt. You have to repay bonds with like money that you actually have, not money that you will have. So, yeah, enough about that. All right. Furthermore, we assume that the monetary authority can buy bonds so they can purchase government debt. Now, these bonds are purchased via the creation of what's known as high-powered money, right? bank reserves. It's also called seniorage, and it's governed by this flow equation, this law of motion of money, right, right here. And it's basically telling us that we got one plus the inflation rate times the amount of money that we're going to print today minus the amount of money that's already been printed. So that's the creation of new money. Now we're controlling for inflation. Uh, you know, we print more money, right? If you print more money, you're going to have more inflation. So that's what that one plus pi t is for, right? That's the inflation rate that we will get by printing more money, mt plus one. So we can... This purchase of debt that's issued by the fiscal authority means essentially debt's converted into liquidity. What do I mean by that? Well, the treasury has to borrow money, right? So they just go out and they essentially just sell these fancy pieces of paper. And it's a really pretty looking piece of paper, and it basically is like an IOU. It says, I'll pay you back at some point in the future. Well, okay, that piece of paper is worth money because it's going to mean there's a future stream of cash payments coming in, right? Now, let's say instead of taking that future stream of cash payments, the monetary authority comes along and says, hey, you know what? We got a lot of money, so we are going to take that fancy piece of paper that's going to give you this nice steady stream of income over the next however many periods it is, whatever the maturity is on that bond. Um, and instead of letting you get it over you know, these certain periods in the future, we're just going to give it all to you now. Right? They buy that bond from you, and they convert that fancy piece of paper back into money. Now, it's usually bank reserves that that gets converted into. And therefore, they've converted that debt, which is essentially pretty illiquid, into liquidity. Because, well, liquidity is the most liquid thing because it can be converted into money very easily because it is just basically spending cash, right? And the creation of bank reserves however, increases inflation at a rate of pi t. Now, all variables in this model are expressed in real, not nominal terms. Typically, what happens with these types of models is they're initially expressed in nominal terms, they're converted into real terms, but there's a lot of math, and honestly, there's, there's no point in doing it for this lecture because it's just it's more algebra and just rote memorization, essentially, that you don't really need to know because... The important part of this is what's happening in real terms because then we're controlling for things like inflation. Now, the fiscal authority can't issue infinite debt. Now, you've already said that, right? They can't just go, you know what? We want to borrow infinity dollars because, well, as much as you know, guys like Bernie Sanders might want to tell you that something like that would work or any proponent of modern monetary theory, um, you can't really do that, right? You also can't take on debt to pay back your existing debt, right? That's like taking out a credit card to pay for a credit card you already have. It's kind of a bad idea. So they can't pay back debt with more debt, and they can't issue infinite debt. Simultaneously, the monetary authority can't print infinite money, right? We can't just give everyone infinity dollars because, well, that means you have infinity inflation, and that's bad. So there are bounds to this, right? There are limits to what the fiscal and monetary authorities can do. And our question really is, what are those limits? When do we hit those limits? And the one that we're really going to answer is what the fiscal authority's limits are. More assumptions. We will further assume that at least one market has monopolistic competition. It's not explicitly needed in this lecture, but it's going to be a good assumption to state anyways, because, well, we need essentially a mechanism for monetary and fiscal policy to transmit 
into the real economy by boosting like output, reducing unemployment, things like that, right? Therefore, we have sticky prices, meaning that prices are slow to respond to shocks. Um, so if there's some kind of like a nominal shock, be it either like a fiscal policy shock, like, you know, the Stimmies, the CARES Act, right? Or something along the lines of like monetary policy shocks. Either one will shift aggregate demand as we saw in the previous model. And if you shift aggregate demand, well, you're going to need some kind of an upward sloping non-vertical aggregate supply in order to have any change to output. So, okay, the exact same thing as what we saw in the last model. Output responds a little bit in the short run and then kind of, well, not so much in the long run. So there can be real effects in response to nominal shocks in this model in the short run, but not the long run. And uh, these assumptions here are going to more closely explain the current situation that we're in. Now, I will be relaxing these two assumptions in a later lecture when I talk about Ricardian equivalents, but I will let you know when I'm relaxing them, and uh, it's not going to be in this video or the one after that. So let's get to the actual math. Let's get to the budget constraint. Consider the following as an economy's real per capita resource constraint. It's y equals c plus i plus g, right? So what you know is GDP and a lot of like advanced macroeconomic like business cycle models, it's actually also treated as a resource constraint because you know there's the whole constraint optimization. We're trying to maximize utility subject to constraints. Same thing is actually going on here. We just need some kind of a constraint. What this does is this ties output or income with the sum of consumption, investment, and government spending. <laughs> so output or income, Y, can't be exceeded by the sum of consumption, investment, and government spending. So this is really a, uh, hold on, I got a sneeze coming, or maybe I don't. Uh, <coughs> there we go, cool. Uh, glad that's out of the way. So it's a constraint on how finite resources can be allocated in the economy each period. Now from equation one, we need to, we need to define income or output as the following production function, which is y equals a times k to the power of alpha. Now, all firms have access to the same production technology where capital, the k, I'm assuming it's a sick joke on uh, the Marxism thing with, you know, das Kapital or whatever, God, Marx was an idiot, uh, being used to produce output y. Um, maybe you didn't hear me say that uh, just then. Uh, if you did, uh, you didn't. Turn on the gas light. <laughs> now, A, A sub T, is a source of stochastic shocks that increase the availability of efficient technology. A is larger than 1. It's a positive technology shock. Firms can make more, and they can make more more efficiently. It's less than 1. It's a negative technology shock. It's like firms lose technology. Um, it, it's kind of strange to think about how that works. Um, there's, like... A, a way to actually kind of explain it in the context of the model, but it's not really the explanation in like the real world. It's it's weird, but it's less than one. There's a negative technology shock. Just think of it like that. Now, if it's equal to one, there's no technology shock. We are going to assume about this production function that A, <clears throat> God, I'm all like sniffly and stopped up. It is not COVID. So don't worry. I don't have COVID. Um, even if I did, we're separated by, I believe it's like 163 miles between where I currently am and where you are in Tennessee. Um, and not only are you separated by like 163 miles, you're also separated by like a computer screen. So I think you should be fine. Um, long, long, long thing to say. If you get COVID-19, it is not my fault. Um, anyways, we were going to assume that the source of technology shocks, A sub T, is distributed. That's what that cute little tilde thing means. It's distributed. It's got a distribution, if you've taken statistics, that is normal. That's what that capital N stands for. It's a normal distribution, so the bell curve, right, with a mean of 1 and a variance of sigma squared. So standard deviation would be sigma. Now, the mean of 1 means it's centered at 1. The peak is at 1. It's a symmetric distribution. So basically every single period, chances are a sub t is going to be equal to 1. It will be equal to 1 more than it's equal to anything else. Alpha is capital's share of income. So let's say if alpha is like 0.33, then capital is responsible for 33% of the income generated in the production process. And that means labor is responsible for 67%. 
These are that's a fairly typical assumption up until very recently. Now, you're not explicitly seeing labor in here. Why? Well, because look at equation two. There's no L, right? There's no labor. It's just Y equals A times K to the alpha. That's it. There's no L. But if you look at the first bullet point, consider the economy or consider it the following as an economy's real per capita resource constraint. This is per person, right? Well, this is essentially output per person, capital per person. So because of that, because it's in terms of like effective labor units, right, we've got essentially, we've kind of already got labor in there. It's implicit now. It's not explicitly modeled as implicit because it's per capita. But enough about that. The more capital we add to production, the more output is going to increase, right? If you have more capital, more inputs into a production function, you're going to get more output. There's never going to be a situation where you put more input in and you get less output. And you're probably going like, well, Jeremy, what about the like diminishing marginal return stuff? Yeah. Yeah, diminishing marginal returns. It's in the margins, not the level, right? The level of output will always increase, but the level of output will always increase at a decreasing rate. That's what diminishing marginal returns means. So if you add one unit of capital right now, okay, you will get more output. If you add 100 units of capital, you will get much more output than if you added 100 or if you added one unit of capital. But when you go from one unit of capital to two units of capital, the amount that output increased from that zero to one, from one to two, right, those amounts will be smaller. Zero to one will be a really large increase. One to two will be not quite as much of an increase. That's what diminishing marginal returns mean. It's a positive first derivative. It's a negative second derivative. Cool. So from equation two and equation one, right, we can substitute that production function in for y to get this right here. Now, investment, right? Well, investment's the flow of new capital, right? So equation four is what's known as the law of motion of capital. It's KT plus one new capital. We buy new capital today to be used tomorrow, right? But it's less depreciation on the existing physical capital that we have. So if I take that, I equals KT plus one minus one minus delta times KT, right? And that delta is the rate of depreciation on physical capital. Now, depreciation would be like if, you know, you're, say, a truck driver, right? You got to drive and drive and drive and drive and drive. Well, those tires are going to fall apart. You need to replace those tires. So if the company that you work for is investing in new growth for that company, well, some of what they invest has to go towards replacing stuff that they've already bought but fell apart, like those tires. Once they've covered that, they can buy new stuff, right? But they got to replace the broken old stuff first. So now what we've got is this A times K to the alpha equals C, plus everything in pink, right? That's investment, plus GT. Now, that basically describes a macro economy, right? Because we're kind of endogenizing stuff within there. We've endogenized output, we've got capital, so we can explain how the addition of capital today can increase uh, production tomorrow, stuff like that. That's good and useful for the third lecture. But I thought, what the hell, just give it to you now. Summarize it. <laughs> That way, when you see it in the third lecture, it's the second time you've seen it, so it's not quite as scary as the first time. But what we need to worry about is the stuff in the public sector, right? So I've covered basically Y and I, but there's that G term I got to take care of. Because that's what we need to know about if we want to understand the debt ceiling. So let's get into that. Well, the fiscal authority has its own constraint, right? Because every single period, the government, they want to spend stuff, they have a constraint. They there's no such thing as like unconstrained borrowing. So this is their constraint. So it's GT plus this RT minus one times BTF, F for fiscal, right? So the fiscal authority is issuing these, they're public bonds. So what they spend plus what they service on the existing debt, that RT minus one times BT, is equal to taxes plus bonds they take out today for tomorrow minus bonds from today, plus this RCBT. So the left-hand side of equation six 
is government spending plus the current payments on existing debt. So government spending plus the current payments on existing debt can't be exceeded by tax revenue, new debt issuance, and receipts from the central bank. So the left-hand side of the constraint, equation six, right, everything on the left side of that equal sign is the use of funds. Everything on the right-hand side is the source of funds. So the use of funds has to be equal to the source of funds. When that happens, the fiscal authority's budget constraint is satisfied. If they are not equal, well, then the fiscal authority's budget constraint is not satisfied. Now, here's a weird thing, because I'm sure you've probably heard, you know, people going on and on, well, government's, you know, doing stuff they can't manage, they can't take, you know, they can't handle this kind of spending and all that stuff. Well, yes and no. Oddly enough, every single period, the government's budget constraint is satisfied. It's always satisfied. It has to be satisfied. There's no way it can't be. Now, they might take out more debt than what you would like. Okay, but their constraint satisfied. A satisfied budget constraint does not mean a balanced budget. Balanced budget is government spending equals tax revenue. They don't have to borrow anything. A satisfied budget constraint can mean a balanced budget, but it also includes borrowing. So that's the big difference there. <clears throat> so what's this RCBT thing mean? Well, here's the way it works. Monetary authority buys bonds from the market to change the money supply. Now, they may end up earning profits from this, and if they do, they have to turn them over to the Treasury, which is the fiscal authority. Right? So if you've ever heard anybody go on about the Federal Reserve and it's this you know, evil Ponzi scheme, they're trying to extract wealth from the United States public, and you know they're making all these profits off their monetary policy and keeping it, whatever. That's all bullshit. Okay, that just right now, I, I hope you don't mind me saying that. That's bullshit. What's happening is if they earn any profits from it, that immediately gets turned over to the Treasury. So when that gets turned over, it means the government can spend it, but the Federal Reserve isn't like just sitting on massive amounts of these profits or anything like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the constraint a little bit in a way that's a little bit easier to sort of understand. I don't Oh, shit. Got that GT plus equals. Forget there's a plus there. It's not supposed to be a plus there. It's supposed to just be GT equals tau T plus 1 plus R to the negative 1 or 1 over 1 plus R times BT plus 1 minus BT plus the receipts from the central bank. Now, the fiscal authority would sell bonds on the market at an interest rate R to be paid back in, say, period T plus 1 if it's a one-period bond. Now, we're assuming here it's a one-period bond just because it's easier, but even with a one-period bond, there's a lot we can still do with it. So We can still get a lot of information. Actually, we can get just about every single bit of information that we need, at least for the context and the level of uh, which this course is. So in this particular situation, the monetary authority is going to be buying bonds on the market. And they buy these bonds with bank reserves. It's what's known as high-powered money. This creation of new reserves is called seniorage. It's like a French term or something like that. Now, the monetary authority's budget constraint is, therefore, this RCBT equals the bonds that the monetary authority buys at BTM minus 1 over 1 plus R, or 1 over 1 plus the interest rate, excuse me, times the bonds that they're going to buy today, right? So the BTM, that's what they've already purchased. They bought that yesterday. BT plus 1M is what they're going to be buying today. And then we add seniorage to that. Why are we adding seniorage? Because that's these open market operations in which they're buying these bonds, right, is generating seniorage. It's generating revenue because as we print more money, right, that's revenue, and on top of that, as we inflate out our debt, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but as we inflate out our debt, that also is essentially a source of revenue. It's what's known as a hidden tax on the public because it's transferring wealth in a way that you're not actually just seeing like in nominal terms on your paycheck. But enough about that. ST is seniorage. Seniorage is given by what I showed you earlier, 1 plus pi times MT plus 1 minus MT. 
So it's the creation of new money accounting for the effect that inflation has on the economy given the creation of new money. And so the monetary authority prints money to buy bonds. That's called seniorage. Now, I'm sure you've probably heard people talking about, like, you know, the government printing money to pay for stuff. If you listen to any kind of conservative media, chances are you hear that more than once, right? There's, there's always some conservative pundit who's just going on and jabbering on and on and on about oh, the government's just printing money, right? They're just, they're just the, the government's going to print money to pay for all this crap. Well, that's not really true, nor is, like, they're inflating out the debt, man, it's not really that simple. Now, if you've heard about either of those two things, right, you've heard about seniorage, but people aren't articulating it well. Now, I may have said back here something about like, okay, they're generating inflation, and that's going to have, you know, effects on the debt, right? Because if you inflate, essentially, if you do inflate out the debt, right, in nominal terms, the debt stays the same, but in real terms, the debt gets a little bit smaller, that's what inflating out the debt is. It's also known as monetizing the debt. So, generally, though, when you hear people talk about inflating out the debt, they don't know what the F they're talking about. They don't articulate it very well, or they just have no idea what they're saying. And honestly, with some of them, either one is equally likely. And uh, if uh, anybody is listening to this and they're like, oh man, he's dogging conservatives right now. Don't worry, I dog liberals just as hard whenever they say something dumb too, right? Both sides are generally pretty dumb when it comes to things because some they're like kind of right on one thing and then wrong on everything else. And that happens for both sides. But anyways, yeah, I just didn't want to think I'm leaning one way or the other, like making anyone think I'm leaning one way or the other. Uh, but there are a lot of conservative pundits that'll say government's printing money to pay for this and they're inflating out the debt and they're monetizing. Well, they usually don't know what they're talking about. So here's how it actually works. When the central bank prints money to buy bonds, they are injecting liquidity into the markets. This creation of liquidity, bank reserves, is given by the flow of money over time, which is seniorage. Now that pi t term means that there is inflation going on. Because if the central bank creates liquidity, well, they're essentially generating inflation because now you've got more money chasing the same number of goods. So they can buy bonds from the market via the creation of excess reserves. And when those bonds are paid off by the fiscal authority, the fiscal authority is paying interest on those bonds to the central bank. The central bank makes money off of it. Well, they just hand it right back over to the fiscal authority. Right? So if that's the case then all we really need to do is just combine the constraints for the fiscal and monetary authorities. And we do this by substituting out that RCBT. Now, why are we doing this? Well, like I said earlier in either this lecture or the lecture before it, um, I don't really know, is it all kind of stream together? Uh, fiscal and monetary policy are separate, but they work in tandem. So we want these two constraints, right? Fiscal authority, the monetary authority's constraints, we want these two guys, we just want to put them together. Well, we got an RCBT in both equations here, right? Pretty much everything else we got isn't really going to work, right? I guess we could sub it out for that interest rate R, but the monetary authority kind of cares about what the interest rate is, as does, you know, the treasury. Uh, the superscripts on the bonds are different, so we can't substitute those out, not to mention, right? Those are actively chosen by both the fiscal and monetary authorities. But the receipts from the central bank are nowhere near as important. Let me just substitute that in there. And what I do, right, so everything in pink in equation 11, right, the right-hand side of equation 11 gets subbed in for that pink RCBT term in equation 10, and it gives me this really long equation 12. This is what we got so far, right? So now I've got government spending equals lump sum taxes plus the flow of government bonds plus the, essentially the flow, but it's like the inverse of that, right? Because I got BTM minus one plus R inverse BT plus one M in the pink. And then in the black, I got one plus RT inverse BT plus one F minus BTF, right? Why is that? Well, the 
Treasury is selling these bonds. The monetary authority is buying these bonds. There's two different sides of the equation here, right? So you're going to have these two different things going on. Now, the monetary authority isn't buying every single bond that the fiscal authority is selling, right? There are still some that are left in the open market. So BTM and BTF are not equal. They could be, but that's a special case out of a continuum of cases. So they're not equal, so you can't just go, okay, well, BTF, like negative BTF plus BTM goes to zero. That's not what happens here because there are still bonds that are left in the open market that are still being held by the public. So with these constraints combined, right, we're going to define for all I that are basically in the interval zero to infinity, all integers I, I is an integer here, BT plus I equals BT plus I superscript F minus BT plus I superscript M, right? So what I'm doing is I'm essentially taking the bonds that are issued by the fiscal authority and I'm subtracting out the bonds that are being held by the monetary authority, and that's the debt that's being held by the public. If I do that, right, well, one, plus, 1 over 1 plus R times BT plus 1 is now the sum of bonds, or I guess really the difference, not the sum, the difference held, the difference in bonds held or issued by the fiscal authority and bonds held by the monetary authority, right? That's the debt that's sitting out that's being held by the public. So I rewrite the constraint now to have basically this. So it's a little bit simpler. It's a little bit nicer to look at, right? Because really, we're concerned about the debt that's being held by the public at the moment. Now, the debt being held by the monetary authority is important, and that is an interesting question to ask, but that's not a question we're really going to be asking in this particular context, right? We're concerned about the debt being held by the public. Oh, excuse me. So this is now the government's budget constraint, where we have combined the fiscal and monetary authorities constraints. So now government spending has to be equal to taxes plus debt that's generated plus money that's generated. And we've got the real interest rate on the bonds, and we've got the inflation rate on money, right? So if you want to sell more bonds, fine, but you got to pay back more bonds at a more interest, and the more you buy, you're probably going to be a higher interest rate, right? Because that R sub T is variable over time. It's not like a constant interest rate. It changes. And uh, then you've got this one plus pi, the one plus inflation, right? So the more money you print, the more inflation you get. So the government, honestly, would be best served to try to tax as much as it possibly can. So it doesn't have to pay as much back, and it doesn't have to deal with a rising inflation problem. So the government can spend money, and it can be financed by taxing, borrowing, or money creation that is, quote-unquote, inflating out the debt, seniorage. Right? And by the way, if you ever want to sound really intelligent in a debate or a discussion, call it seniorage. Do not call it inflating out the debt. You can call it inflating out the debt because that is essentially what's happening. It's monetizing the debt, but seniorage sounds cooler and it makes people go, wow, this person really knows what they're talking about. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that <laughs> we had to talk about it some more. It means the government wants to borrow funds to finance some new project by buying some new bonds, right? Now, it's doing this in real terms. There's no equation for this yet, but it increases interest rates by crowding out private investment. You've already seen that before, right? So the government wants to spend more, they want to borrow more, well, it crowds out private investment. Now, if private investment is being crowded out, it's not good, right? Because it's crowding out private investment. That sucks. So the central bank will now generate some excess reserves, liquidity, and they will buy bonds with them, thereby reducing the interest rate, right? Because there is now more liquidity in the markets, and the interest rate is being determined by the amount of liquidity, right? The more liquidity there is, the more money can be lent out 
the lower an interest rate is because the opportunity cost on that money is much lower because you've got more of it. Now, if you don't have a lot of liquidity in the markets, right, there aren't a lot of loanable funds, then you're going to demand a higher rate of interest because the opportunity cost is now much higher, right? The interest rate is the opportunity cost of holding idle cash. So they do this, they can buy bonds, they reduce the nominal interest rate. But we've got senior age, right? So if they want to reduce the nominal interest rate, that's fine, but they're going to be increasing the rate of inflation. So seniorage goes up, money goes up, inflation goes up. So this kind of leads us to a question of who's in control, right? Is the fiscal authority in control of this or is the monetary authority in control of this? And the answer is, well, it kind of depends on, well, what's going on. Now, whoever's in control here is the one that gets to move first. The one who moves first is known as having an active measure in policy, and the one that moves second is passive. So if the fiscal authority moves first, then it's active, and monetary policy is passive. In this case, at the beginning of each period, the fiscal authority sets their choice for government spending, taxation, and borrowing. Can the government set this equal to whatever they want? Well, if they get to move first, strangely and scarily enough, yeah. They can kind of set them equal to whatever they want because there's a free variable, which is seniorage. Seniorage is given by that flow of money, right? Now, the monetary authority has to respond by setting seniorage equal to a value that satisfies the government's budget constraints. So the government can go, we're going to spend whatever the hell we want because we're going to set G, tau, and B, right? So we're going to set how much we want to spend we're going to determine how much we want to tax and how much we want to borrow, right? And if, say, we want to tax some, we want to borrow some, but we don't really get enough from taxation and borrowing, then we can force the central bank to essentially pick up the slack and fund whatever is left, right? Whatever needs to be funded. So in that case, the central bank is kind of like the slave to the treasury. It's not very good, right? Why isn't that good? Well, is really it means that you give every single clown in Congress a lot of power to spend whatever the hell they want, and the Federal Reserve has to just basically pick up the tab. It's a blank check in this case. Now, in that particular case, fiscal policy is active and monetary policy is passive. The fiscal authority gets a first mover's advantage, and the monetary authority has to respond to whatever the fiscal authority does. So that is the case of active fiscal policy, passive monetary policy, right? Fiscal policy dominance in this case. Fiscal policy is dominating over monetary policy. Let's flip it. Right? Let's flip it around. So this time, the monetary authority gets to set MT plus one first. They set a path for the money growth over time. And then the fiscal authority has to respond by setting G, BT plus one, and tau. In this case, the monetary authority gets the first mover's advantage. In the previous case, the government could set all three of its variables to whatever the hell it wanted because the central bank would have to print money to pick up the slack. In this case, what we're getting is the government can only choose two of those three variables, right? So if they want to set how much they want to spend and how much they want to borrow, well, tau taxes is going to pick up the slack between what they're spending and what they're borrowing. Or if they go, we want to spend, let's say they want to spend $100, right? But they can only tax $75 of that. They can choose how much they want to spend and how much they want to tax. And they have to borrow that remaining $25 because there isn't that extra free variable, right? There isn't seniorage anymore because, well, central bank moved first. So they don't get to just go, oh, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to set G, B, and tau to whatever we want. They can't do that. So if they decide two of the three variables, the third one is determined by, like, default. So the government can only choose two of its variables, and it has to satisfy whatever that remaining one is. So the government's more constrained in this situation, right? The government doesn't just get to spend whatever they want willy-nilly. They get to go, well, actually, we kind of have to 
be kind of careful in this, right? So you, you don't have that blank check. It's not like the National Bank of Mom anymore. So with that said, ask yourself this question. Which one do you think is better? Now, might have kind of already unfortunately biased this um, in my little talk. Oh, well. Um, but ask yourself, which one is better? And, you know, if I did bias it for you a little bit, ask yourself why that one would be better. All right, why do you think that one would be better over the other? Do you, would you prefer active monetary policy and passive fiscal, or would you prefer active fiscal and passive monetary? And then ask yourself this, which one do you think operates in the United States? All right, that's, that's going to be a, a really honestly much more important question because that'll kind of help you sort of determine the way that I think the United States operates. And this is a particular situation where there is, in fact, a correct answer. So there's an incorrect and a correct answer. Um, so which one do you think operates in the U.S.? Uh, you know, ask yourself that before you watch the next video and uh, kind of stew on it, right? Think about it for a little while and uh, see which one um, you think you're going to get. So on that, uh, this wraps up this video. Um, watch out for the next video. It will be coming shortly. And uh, until then, yeah, just stew on these questions. And uh, until next time, peace.